You're listening to the Right Stream Radio Network, rejoicing in the flow of creativity. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at RightStream and hashtag RightStream. Thanks for listening to the Right Stream Radio Network. Publishing LLC, along with my beautiful friend and business partner Lisa Tarvis, and I want to thank you for tuning in again this week. Um, as many of you know, we have been really hard at work at Rightstream Publishing. We've just been releasing several books. It's kind of funny, you know, we didn't exactly plan it this way, but many books sort of came together at the same time for release, and so uh, we're thrilled. We are absolutely thrilled uh, with that. It, it has required a, a, a huge time commitment. Um, for anyone who's independently published, um, you kind of know what we're talking about. There's a lot of different, especially with Amazon, there's so many different like sub-websites that you have to log on to to get things on Kindle and to set up an author page and then to, to upload the book. But we are very excited. Um, I'll start with the, the one that I'm most excited about since I was the ghostwriter. Um, Lieutenant Keith Schneider's book, To Guard My Every Neighbor, Inside the Fire, is now available for pre-order on Amazon.com, and we will be officially releasing that on May 31st. And I'm really proud of this project. Like most of my ghostwriting projects, probably all of them, it was an incredible learning experience. I had no idea, really, what the role of a fireman entailed. I mean, I had no idea how expansive it was and how difficult, really, that it is for first responders, not just firemen. The book talks about paramedics and police and dispatchers and everyone involved in serving their communities, you know, at, at the worst times in people's lives. I mean, the, the book really gives credit to all of those people and um, ma- it makes the public aware of how PTSD also affects first responders. So please visit, if you want to read more about it, there, you know, go to Amazon.com. It's To Guard My Every Neighbor Inside the Fire. Um, you can also find out more about it at RightStreamPublishing.com, where you can also learn about uh, some of the other re- releases we have out, including... Honey, I'm Fabulous, and So Are You by Leo Brown, also known as Psychic Leo. He has been a guest on Lisa's program many times, just believe, on the Right Stream Radio Network. And um, we've got, my goodness, I, you know, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. I don't know why, but go to, <laughs> you know, go to rightstreampublishing.com. Uh, there are so many more. We're going to be releasing also in May, end of May, uh, in time for Memorial Day, Moments of Choice, My Path to Leadership, by Major General Linda L. Singh, and boy, is she an inspiring woman. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get her book out there because I know it's going to help so many people. Uh, Linda has overcome really incredible challenges in her life, but always with a, a very positive, optimistic attitude and a willingness to serve and help others. So um, look for Moments of Choice, My Path to Leadership, uh, to be released uh, in time for Memorial Day. So it's coming up, gosh, it's already May, so coming up at the end of the month. Anyway, again, RightStreamPublishing.com, and for a full lineup of our hosts and shows on this network, visit RightStreamRadio.com, where you can read some testimonials, like one from my guest that I'm about to introduce, uh, about his experience on my show, because he is a returning guest. His name is Garnet Schulhauser, and I am so excited to have him on, because I love talking about spirituality and spiritual topics. Absolutely love this. Um, and Garnet, let me just tell you a little bit about him for uh, those who are meeting him for the first time today. Um, Garnet Schulhauser is a retired lawyer who lives near Victoria on Vancouver Island with his wife, Kathy, and little dog, Abby. 
After practicing corporate law for over 30 years in Calgary with two blue chip law firms, he retired in 2008 and his first book, Dancing on a Stamp, was published in 2012. Since its release, Garnet has been active with book signing tours and speaking engagements and has been a frequent guest on radio talk shows. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on his third book called Dance of Heavenly Bliss. Um, it continues the saga of his astral tip trips with Albert, his spirit guide, who takes him to meet Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth, two of Earth's myth mythical creatures, a Sasquatch and an Irish fairy who live in fear of humans, and a human civilization on another planet that is ruled by women. I like that. <laughs> on the spirit side, he met many fascinating souls who regaled him with tales of their lives on Earth, including Moses, Jesus and his mother Mary, Lucifer, and the goddess Athena. These trips were designed to inspire humans to appreciate the diversity of life in the universe and encourage us to love and respect one another, Mother Earth, and all the creatures who share our planet. So it was, it's with great pleasure that I welcome back Arthur Garnett Schulhauser. Hi, Darianne. How are you? Thank you for having me uh, back on your show. I'm well. Well, you know, it's, it's a pleasure, absolute, an absolute pleasure. I could talk about your books and, and these spirituality topics all day long. And I'm, really, congratulations. First of all, before we start the interview, congrats on your third book. Oh, thank you very much. It was just released in March and uh, is doing very well, and I'm quite pleased with the results so far, and I'm very happy to talk on radio shows about my third book, which I think is, in my view, is, is the best one of the three. So yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. I, you know, and, and I know in this book, in Dance of Heavenly Bliss, Albert, who's your spirit guide, um, this time he took you on an astral trip to visit a killer whale locked up in an aquarium. So wow, I, I really would love to hear what message uh, she gave to you. Yeah, it was. It was. It was one of uh, one of the first trips in the second batch that I, I took with Albert, which are described in my third book. Anyway, it was a, a killer whale in an aquarium in California. Um, uh, her name was Yolanda, and we spoke by telepathy because you know when I'm traveling with as with, uh, with Albert, I'm, I'm in astral form, and so is he, and I can easily communicate with other creatures by telepathy. So. We spoke by telepathy, and uh, this killer whale basically said, you know, uh, she was really uh, sad about the, uh, the way uh, things had turned out for her. She had been born freely in the Pacific where she got to roam in the blue waters, uh, you know, uh, with, with the other members of her pod until she was captured by humans, and then she was locked up in this concrete prison, this aquarium. And, and she said that it was it was really uh, she was very sad about it because you know the 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 people her trainers who are very kind to her couldn't communicate with her even though she could communicate with other whales and other you know you know other animals by telepathy she just couldn't get through to her uh, her trainers and so she was forced to be to, to to be locked up in this prison and perform silly tricks for spectators who didn't seem to know or care about her plate at all and and so she said I, I you know whales and and Dolphins uh, are very intelligent, emotional, feeling creatures, uh, much more so than humans give them credit for. And she didn't understand why humans have been so abusive over the centuries to, to uh, you know, to her kin and other whales, like killing them with in, in uh, whaling ships and trapping them in traps and uh, imprisoning them in aquariums and and causing them uh, problems by polluting their oceans. And and she really wished that humans would treat them in a better fashion. And she knows that. That lately humans have been more uh, astute about uh, understanding their plight and trying to stop the abuse, but there's still too much of it going on. And she really said, "No, look at. Can you please tell your fellow humans that we just want to live in peace and harmony with with humans? We don't want to cause them any harm, but we don't want to suffer any abuse at their hands. And please tell my captors to let me go free because I'd like to once again roam in the blue waters of the Pacific." So it was quite a a, a plea for me to to. to uh, send her message back to my fellow humans, which I tried to do by, by having a chapter about her in my book. But anyway, it, it, it was very much of a, if you, if you could speak to this beautiful, intelligent creature uh, like I did, you would, your, your heart would just go out for her and you would say, why are we doing this to her and to, uh, you know, the other members of her race? Oh, wow. That is, that's so sad. I, yeah, I don't understand that either, why, why we're doing that. Um, I mean, what has, you know, let me just ask you, uh, Garnet, what has been the reaction to that particular chapter? Has it uh, inspired people? Have you heard from many readers that are inspired to take action in some, some way to 
help release these whales or help become part of the movement that releases them? Yeah, I've had a lot of positive comments about that, and uh, a lot of the people say that just goes to show what my feelings were before, which is that these are very intelligent, sensitive creatures, and we as humans have no right to do this to them. And so, yeah, a lot of them just said, yeah, I'm going to try to do whatever I can to try to get them to be uh, freed from their water parks um, and also just to make sure that the whales that are free in the oceans aren't hunted and killed by humans. And so I think that really has encouraged a lot of people, and it really sort of drove home to them the fact that uh, you know these pe- these creatures are really very intelligent, sensitive, and emotional beings, and they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And so I think I've encouraged a lot of people to sort of jump on the bandwagon in that regard. Oh, that's excellent. Okay, now tell us about your meeting with Gaia. This I'm really curious about. Um, tell us about your meeting with Gaia, the consciousness of, of Mother Earth. Right. Well, it was on one of my astral trips. Albert took me to a cavern underneath the North Pole of our planet. Um, and there, to my surprise, I got to have a conversation with the consciousness of Mother Earth, uh, Gaia. And she, you know, before this, I'd always thought, like most people, that our planet was just uh, an inert group of molecules forming, you know, rocks and deserts and oceans and mountains and that sort of thing. But our planet really does have a consciousness which may surprise a lot of people, and a lot of people may be shaking their heads saying, I, you know, I don't believe it, how can that be? But uh, I, I, I learned firsthand because I spoke to Gaia, and she, uh, her story was basically that, uh, you know what, she's very fiercely protective of all her, her flora and fauna, all the creatures and plants and on her, uh, you know, on her, in her uh, surface, beneath the surface, uh, you know, right down to the core. She, she's sort of the sum total of everything on the planet. And, she's, and she really wants everybody on the planet, all the humans and all the other animals and, and all of her plants, to live in peaceful harmony. She wants to have a very balanced and harmonious ecosystem for everyone. And she was dismayed. What she told me was she's dismayed at, at the way that humans have lately come along to upset the apple cart, basically, because of our pollution. Uh, she said we're, we're very much uh, like an invasive plant that has taken over somebody's garden and snuffed out all other life. And she said, it didn't used to be this way, way back when humans were very much, uh, you know, you know uh, a none effect in terms of the ecosystem. You know, they, in the caveman days, they didn't pollute uh, the atmosphere or the water or the soil. And they didn't cause much damage to, to anyone, and they were not particularly abusive to the other animals because they didn't have the capability. But ever since the Industrial Revolution... We've have to, you know we we've, we've become way more uh, intrusive into the ecosystem uh, you know through our pollution and by our technological advances we can abuse animals we have you know weapons we can we we, we can destroy them maim them we can trap them kill them uh, and so we become sort of a, a force to be reckoned with but not in a good sense and so she's very dismayed at what, how humans have been carrying on and her plea to me was that uh, please tell your fellow humans to uh, to stop abusing the place they live in but with their pollution because if they don't stop and change their ways very soon, it's going to go very badly for us. And then the surprising thing she said was that she has the capability of fighting back. And what she said was that she can increase the frequency and intensity of natural disasters on our planet, like hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, um, you know, volcanoes. Um, and, and she has been doing a bit of that lately because she wants us to wake up she wants to fire a warning shot across our bow to make us realize that the path we're on uh, is not going to end nicely unless we really change our ways and so her, her she sort of echoed what, what uh, the orca had told me was that you know humans have no right to abuse the other creatures on, they live with uh, and they should treat them with dignity and respect and they should respect the place that they live their home mother earth uh, and, and cut back on their pollution and uh, sort of change their ways. And so that was her plea, and she really hoped, she, she really has no animosity towards humans. She wants humans to live on her planet in peace and harmony with everyone else, but she really doesn't like the way humans have sort of gone off on a tangent uh, and, and sort of uh, dominating the world in a way that's not useful or helpful to the other members of, the, of, our, uh, of our planet or to pl- Mother Earth herself. So that was her message, which was a very strong message. It, re- it really sort of resonated with me, and um, I hope it resonates with anyone who reads my book. Yeah, that's very powerful. Oh, I'm sure that it, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it has. Um, that, well, that's pretty amazing. Now, you, gosh, you've had so many amazing, interesting encounters, including now you've had you had encounters with a Sasquatch, 
and an Irish fairy. So what were they all about, Garnet? Well, um, after I'd left my meeting with Gaia, I, I said to Albert, my guide, I said, you know, I'm really surprised that, that, that Mother Earth has a consciousness. And Albert says, oh, well, uh, you know, Gaia has way more secrets up her sleeve than you can ever imagine. And I said, well, <laughs> give me an example. He says, okay, I'll show you. So he took me first off was to the Pacific Northwest of, uh, of, uh, of, of America. And there in a very secluded forest high in the mountains, I met with a Sasquatch. Now, Sasquatch are fabled creatures, and there's been legends about them, and a lot of people claim they exist. A lot of people claim they don't exist. Uh, they have different names like Yeti and uh, Bigfoot and the Abominable Snowman. But basically, I did meet with one, and she was uh, about nine feet tall with, a, with an ape-like head, and her uh, muscular body was covered with dark brown hair, and we communicated by telepathy. And she told me that her race has been living secretly among humans for, like, eons, uh, basically on all the continents except Antarctica. Uh, and they come, as I said, they, they, they're referred to by various names. And she says that they deliberately avoid contact with humans because they view us to be violent and aggressive, and they don't want to have anything to do with us. And so they hide underground uh, most of the time, come out sometimes at night, um, and they, they dearly want to avoid being contacted or captured or have any other contact with humans. And she says that they communicate with each other by telepathy, um, and they're very much of a peace-loving race that wants to live in harmony with nature and live close to nature, and so they have not developed any technology, even though they are very intelligent creatures, very emotional creatures, very sensitive creatures. And she says that they, they've been able to avoid contact with humans because they have what she termed was a, an animal-sensitive like radar, which allows them to detect humans from many miles away, and that's why they've been able to sort of scurry out of, you know, out of view and, and hide in their underground, underground caves whenever humans, uh, you know, approach them. And so that, that's sort of the, the main tool for their being able to avoid our contact, um, and they plan to continue to do so unless and until humans change their ways and lose their aggression and tendency for violence. And, and she says that, uh, you know, they, they'd be happy. To, they have no animosity towards humans. They'd like to live among us openly in, in, in peace and harmony, but right now they're afraid that if they, if they show themselves to us, they'll end up being locked up in a cage somewhere as circus freaks, and, uh, which isn't a very happy end for them. So, so that was her story. Um, it, you know, it, very, uh, it was sort of a heart-wrenching story because it would have been wonderful if these people could just live openly among us, but, but, but they viewed humans as such, a, such an invasive, aggressive, and violent race that they just couldn't see themselves uh, you know, making open contact. And so that was her story, and she wanted me to, to explain that to my fellow humans. Now, m most humans, of course, probably won't believe that I met with a Sasquatch, and they'll say, give me proof. I can't prove it because she wasn't willing to sort of, uh, as I say, come out, uh, you know, in the open and say, look, here I am, because she probably would have been stuck in a cage somewhere or po uh, poked and prodded in a, in a lab by scientists which wasn't an outcome that she really desired. So they're going to stay in hiding until humans can change their ways. Mm. Well, I can't say I blame them. <laughs> so and what about the Irish fairy? What did she have to say? Well, yeah, her, her story was not too much different from the Sasquatch. She was, uh, we, we went over to a, a deserted uh, meadow in Ireland, and there uh, Albert brought out from behind a bush uh, a beautiful little fairy. She was about three feet tall, Exquisite. She looked like a tiny, perfect China doll. Um, and she, again, we communicated by telepathy. She told me that uh, her race had uh, been living in Ireland and the, the, the neighboring islands for many uh, centuries. Um, and they lived happily above the surface, enjoying the, the sunlight, and they could dance in the rain. And then it all changed when humans arrived on the island, uh, you know, a long time ago. And at first, she said, they thought that humans were just larger versions of themselves but they soon found out to their chagrin that humans were just violent and aggressive. I mean, the same theme that, was, uh, that, I, that I mentioned when I, when I met with the Sasquatch. They, just, they, they viewed us as being a, a kind of race that, uh, that they could not live peacefully with, and so they went into underground hiding just like the Sasquatch did. Um, and she said that uh, they really hope again uh, that humans can change their ways and stop their violence and aggression so that uh, they can come out from hiding, uh, live above ground, peacefully with humans and once again uh, frolic in the sunlight and dance in the rain um, and again it was a story of 
a, another race of very intelligent, sensitive, emotional creatures who have to remain in hiding because of the, the, the nature of humans to be, uh, to, to be troublesome and, and to be harmful to, uh, to other creatures who they don't understand. And so a, a very similar tale from a very different race. Uh, and, and, and again, the message was, please, humans, change your ways, reject the dark side of humanity, see the light, and learn to curtail your negative emotions so that we can come out once again and, and live above ground. So it was, again, another heart-wrenching story from a beautiful little creature um, who, uh, again, explained to me that, uh, look, your race is, uh, is basically bad news for us, and we're not going to you know, come out and live openly among you until you change your ways. Now, um, Garnet, can I ask you, I'm just curious, like when, when you, you know, you described her so beautifully, my goodness, um, she sounds just amazing, but are, are, are the, did she appear to you as, as three-dimensional? I know this is astral travel, so you were in your energetic body, right? Is that correct? Yes. When you were, okay, and, and, and so the fairy, was she also in her energetic body? I guess what I'm asking, was, was, did she appear physical or was she... Um, did she appear the same way you were in, in sort of a, in her energetic form? No, she appeared in physical form. She, she wasn't oh, wow. in astral form. Yeah, she was actually in physical form. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, she looked solid just like, I, like anybody else, that, uh, any other human you'd see. So she was very much a solid uh, uh, little entity. Um, and, uh, cool. you know, she's a very, very, very exquisite, as I said, very beautiful little, little creature, uh-huh. very kind and compassionate. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's heart wrenching to hear her story uh, that this, that she and her race had to live underground, um, you know, just because for fear of, of living among humans. And it was really a tragic story that uh, I hope when people read my book that they can, I mean, not that they can go and find fairies, but they can change <laughs> the way humanity lives. And eventually, yeah. if we change our ways, these creatures, the fairies and the Sasquatches, and there's probably others out there who we don't know about, they can once again uh, come and live openly on our planet. But but so far they've all been scared into hiding, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, no, it truly is, and it seems. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. So I think with Ireland, what are, are fairies considered sort of a like a fantasy sort of mythical? There's mythical creatures uh, as far as the culture there is concerned. Like they're, uh, is that how they regard them? I'm, I'm just curious. I know this. I'm kind of going off. Yeah, I think I think they regard them as uh, some people believe that they're real. Others believe they're just mythical, fabled creatures. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and occasionally she said that there, some of her race will actually show themselves uh, to humans here and there, um, but not openly, and it's sort of a fleeting sort of glimpse here and there. Um, and so that's where the legends come from, where people say, oh, yeah, so-and-so has seen a fairy, has seen the little people. Um, but, of course, they, the, the, you know, they're never sort of around to be observed in a, in, a, in a lab or by scientists. And so a lot of people just don't believe it. They think it's a myth. But there it was. I saw her uh, in real, in flesh and blood, and she was a real, live, beautiful little person. And so it would be great if, if, as I said, if she could, they'd love to just come out in the open and live among the people in Ireland, in which case there'd be no doubt about their existence, but they're not prepared to do that yet. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Now, I'm I'm really curious about this one. On, On one of your astral trips, Garnet, you also you went to a planet with a matriarchal human society ruled by women. So, what did you learn about the society? Well, that was an amazing trip, because it, it and it originated when I had asked Albert at one point if uh, human civilizations had only existed on our planet, and he said no, there are human civilizations on many other planets in our galaxy. So he offered to take me to see one, so I could see firsthand, and so we went to this planet called Thrasso. It was a very. Uh, we were traveling astrally, and I should I should mention that when when you're traveling astrally, you can basically, it's virtually instantaneous. So when Albert would say we'd be hovering above the planet Earth, and and he would say, okay, follow me, and we'd end up um, all of a sudden in, in a space of like a half a second, being many light years away from Earth. And so hmm. we did this, and we we came to this planet Thrasso, many light years from Earth, and it was a very, <coughs> excuse me, very modern. Uh, Ultra modern sort of society. They had uh, they had the flying cars and moving walkways and uh, you know you know uh, very uh, extensive technology, uh, much more advanced than Earth actually. And uh, we went to uh, into one of the cities and there in the in, in the palace we met with the with the empress who ruled the planet. Her name was Marpesia, and she was the elected by all the other women in their society. So she had a very interesting story to tell. She says that they are a very matriarchal society 
ruled entirely by women. So women are the only humans that are allowed to vote, and women only can hold positions of power and authority. And the men are not allowed to vote or have any position of any power or authority. And, and she says that the men um, are very docile and compliant uh, because uh, of their very low testosterone levels, which resulted from the fact that they chemically sterilized all male babies at the age of three. And because of the low testosterone, they're very, uh, you, you know, they're easy to get along with, they're not aggressive, and they're very, she says, they're very quite happy in their existence because um, they don't miss uh, their sex drive because they don't ever remember having it, um, and they, uh, they don't care about having positions of power or authority or voting. Uh, they're, they're quite content to uh, pursue recreational activities and, uh, and, and forms of art and just live happy lives. Um, and, and so she says, we don't subjugate our men. We treat them very well. We just don't allow them to have any position of power or authority. And she says, and because of that, she says, there are no crimes or violence or conflicts on our planet because she says that even though the women who rule the planet sometimes have disagreements, they're always able to settle them peacefully. So there's no violence or crime and, and their negative emotions don't run uh, rampant. And so they have a very peaceful society. And she says, uh, and, and, and of course, because of what they do to their male babies, they don't, uh, the, the men and women don't form partnerships and they don't have sex. And their babies are artificially incubated in incubators um, using sperm from a sperm bank which they harvest from a few of the males that they don't sterilize uh, for the purposes of putting them into the sperm bank. And so that's how their society was run. Um, she says uh, this was in contrast to what happened on their planet eons ago when they were a, a patriarchal society dominated by, by violent and aggressive men. And the women there were subjugated in a, in a horrible sense until one woman had a, a dream, a vision one night, uh, where uh, th this uh, spirit told her that there was a plant in their forest that if uh, ingested by men would drastically reduce their testosterone levels. So she secretly found this plant, fed it to her husband, gave it to the other women, and over a, a series of a number of years, the men gradually didn't care about running the planet anymore, and the women took over, and that's been the story ever since. So it's been uh, an amazing transition because they found this, uh, this quite amazing plant. And so that was a, 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 you know, a, a quite a different sort of society from ours. And when I left that planet, uh, Derry, I said to myself, I wonder if there isn't some way for a very happy middle ground between the extremes of that matriarchal society and the extremes of our male-dominated world here on Earth. That would be a happy medium. But uh, anyway, yeah. I was quite happy, Derry, to say that they did not want to stay and linger and live on that planet, and I was happy to get back to planet Earth. <laughs> As yeah, you can yeah. imagine, why? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I think there there, there could be a happy, very happy medium, uh, you know, between the two for, for sure. Now, this next topic really fascinates me, Garnet. I have a very good friend who, um, you know, she's a psychic and she specializes in akashic readings, you know, in akashic records. And so, um, you were there, and you got to. This is just. This is so cool. I think it's so cool that you got to view the building of Stonehenge with the help of visitors from the stars. So please, like, tell us all about that and describe what you saw. Well, it was uh, one of my visits to the Akashic Records, as you mentioned. And uh, there I got to view uh, some scenes from a, a past life that I had as a Druid priest uh, living on the uh, Salisbury Plain of England about 3000 B.C. And... Uh, I watched as uh, as I as I went out to uh, uh, an empty part of the plane as I was directed to do so by uh, a, a, a spirit who told me to do so in a, in a dream I had the night before. So I went out to this plane and then I noticed a starship landing nearby. And out of the starship uh, walks uh, a human uh, a human being, but he was, except he looked very much like a, a, every other human except he was about eight feet tall, um, a beautiful mm -hmm. specimen. And he told me his name uh, was, was Mogans. And he came from a planet in the Andromeda constellation many light years away. And he said that he came to enlist my help. He wanted me to organize the villagers to build a, a, a navigational beacon that he needed for his race. And this beacon was to enable, uh, to, to help stars, uh, sorry, ships in, in, in warp drive navigate between the stars when they were in warp drive. 
which put him in sort of a different scenario. So he wanted a navigational beacon, and he had chosen that particular place because it, it was on one of the galactic ley lines uh, that was very important in terms of, uh, of their navigation. And so um, he, he, he then uh, rolled out a parchment full of very detailed plans for this particular structure. It was Stonehenge. Um, and so um, I went into the village and, and, and told my villagers that uh, we had been visited by a god from the stars and that this god wanted us to build this particular structure um, uh, you know, for, uh, for his own purposes. He had special needs. So the villagers believed me when I, when I told them that this, this guy from the stars was a god. And so we set about, uh, with the help of Mogan, set about um, querying the, the stones that were eventually used in Stonehenge. And, and, and how this worked was that Mogans had uh, some very specialized tools. He had a laser cutting tool and an anti-gravity wand. And the cutting tool could make precise cuts of the of the stones in the quarry, and the anti-gravity wand could basically make them weightless. And so that's how these stones were cut and transported by these prim primitive villagers, basically, uh, over many miles to the spot where Stonehenge currently stands. And then, with Mogan's direction, they put the stones into place. Um, and then, when it was finished, Mogan's went into a ship, came back out, and brought a, a, a basically a box. He called it a power box. I'm not sure what powered it, but the power box was what um, made the whole beacon work. And, and, and the reason for all those stones, uh, special stones, was because they had to work with the power box. They had special um, you know, atomic uh, structure that allowed the navigational beacon to work. So he set, set his power box in the middle, and then the, the, the beacon was basically operational. He left in his ship. Um, and the, uh, um, you know, he, he told me a few years later that... Uh, when the beacon was no longer needed, he actually flew back and secretly grabbed the power box and left. And the villagers never knew the true purpose of Stonehenge. They thought it was just uh, a place to worship, uh, worship the gods, and they used it for religious and ceremonial purposes for many, many, many years. And so that was fascinating. That was how Stonehenge was built, and that was how all those big rocks got transported over so many miles uh, and put in place. And it was with the, the, the laser cutting tool and the anti-gravity wand. So very interesting uh, little scene from the past. Uh, it, was, it was really quite fascinating. That's pretty incredible. What a what an amazing story. Wow. Now I'm you know I know on the spirit side um, you had a meeting with Jesus Christ and Adolf Hitler and I have to say I'm really especially well I'm curious about both of them but uh, just from my own experience I've been making an effort to kind of get to know Jesus without the filter of you know, what I was raised with. I think you and I had this conversation before being raised Catholic. So I've been making a conscious effort to do that without that filter of man-made stuff, you know, getting in the way. So I'm very curious about what you learned from meeting with Jesus Christ and Adolf Hitler. Very curious about that. Yeah, well, it was quite an amazing meeting because uh, <clears throat> Albert told me it was, a, these are the souls on the spirit side, and, and we were there, and Albert told me he's going to take me to meet um, two very, very famous or infamous people. And he said one had been a paragon of virtue, and the other had been an evil monster. And I couldn't for the life of me, you know, quite understand who I was going to meet until we walked up and we saw the two of them sitting on a bench. They were, they were in a very friendly conversation. As I got closer, I sort of, my heart skipped a beat, and I, I could see that one was Jesus Christ in a white robe, and the other one was Adolf Hitler in his military uniform. Oh, and I wondered, how, how did these two get together? Because they seemed to be 180 degrees apart. And... Uh, <clears throat> So uh, Albert introduced me uh, to them, and, 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 and shortly, as soon as he introduced me to Adolf Hitler, uh, you know, Hitler morphed back into what he called his normal uh, appearance on the spirit side, which was a very handsome young man called Matthew. Uh, and he said that he just showed up in the military uniform so I would easily recognize him right off the bat. Oh, so he started wow. talking. Okay. He started talking first. You see, that, and that just uh, confirms what Albert told me, is that spirits on the spirit side can appear to others in whatever form they like, uh, and they can change it as often as they like. And so in this case, he had just sort of uh, shown up as Hitler initially, and then he morphed back into his natural appearance. And so he was a very uh, intelligent, compassionate uh, soul. He said, Matthew was, he told me that uh, yeah, his, his last life had been as Adolf Hitler on our planet, and he was very, very sorry for all the harm and destruction and death he had caused. Um, and, and he said that he, he wished that if he could do it over again, that he wouldn't have done any of that. But he said that um, he had, uh, before his life, he had planned to be born in that particular place, and he had hoped that to have a political career, 
but be, but but on the spirit side in doing his life plan he hadn't planned any of the evil things that he ended up doing and and so he said it was really a case of once i sort of got into the the the, the, the political uh, arena my negative emotions got out of control and i was uh, egged on by some of my uh, uh, other companions in the nazi party and things just got out of control and he said it was horrible uh, all the things i did um, but uh, he said it wasn't planned and it was a, a classic example of uh, all the damage and destruction that can be done when, when a human or many humans let their negative emotions like fear, anger, hate, greed, uh, you know, uh, jealousy, if they get out of control, then there's usually nothing but a lot of violence that happens. And in his particular case, he was in a position to do a whole lot of violence and a whole lot of damage, as we all know. And he was very sorry for that. But he said that he learned a lot after he crossed back over in his life review and he was anxious to return to the, our planet in another incarnation to try to make amends, to try to do better and do some good and, and erase some of the harm that he did. But he told me that um, since crossing over, he has met with many of the souls who were killed in his death camps, and he says there's been total reconciliation because he said, as hard as this is to believe, that once souls cross back over to the spirit side, there's no hangover of hatred or animosity or need for revenge. And so all those souls who were killed in his death camps uh, unconditionally love Matthew as a soul on the spirit side, regardless of what happened back on earth. And he says mm -hmm. that's difficult for so many people to believe because they just can't quite understand that. But he says that's just a fact of life, is that souls on the spirit side regard a life on earth like actors acting in a play. And he says that, uh, you know, if you're acting in a play on Earth and, and the script calls for you to stab and kill another actor, when the curtain goes down, um, y you both leave the, uh, the theater and, and you go for a, you know, a, a drink or something to eat because there's no animosity because it didn't really happen. It was play acting. And so on the spirit side, they re regard life on Earth in a similar fashion so that nothing that happens on Earth in terms of bad things stays there. When you cross over, you understand you know, what life on Earth is all about and you you have you, you you hold no grudges against anybody on the spirit side for what they did to you on earth so that was sort of an amazing revelation something a lot of people find hard to swallow uh, but he says that's just the way it works and so then um the whole time that i'm talking to matthew uh, who used to be hitler jesus is sitting there nodding and smiling uh, you know and, and basically agreeing with everything he said so when it was his turn he said that um he was a, uh, was and still is a master soul who'd been recruited by the Council of Wise Ones to incarnate on Earth like over 2,000 years ago because they felt that humanity needed uh, uh, you know, some guidance and inspiration in terms of uh, uh, becoming more spiritually enlightened. And so he went there to help humanity, as uh, basically as the scriptures say. Um, and he says that because he was a master, he had learned how to focus his thoughts into very powerful beams of energy and that's how he was able to create his miracles. So he could walk on water, turn water into wine, raise people from the dead, because he, he basically had uh, very powerful, focused thoughts. And as a master, he could do that. Uh, and he says, uh, you, know, and, and, you know, his role there was to try to uh, spread the message of love and compassion uh, to uh, humanity. He hoped that humans would change their ways. They would follow his teachings and his guidance. But he was a bit dismayed, he said, that... Uh, he expected that his apostles and the, his followers would probably start a new religion after he passed, but he wasn't sure at the time how it would all play out. And so he says, you know, the Christian church ha has been very useful, has done a lot of good things, but some of their policies and dogmas and beliefs that they've developed since he died are misguided and were driven by, you know, religious holy men who had their own agendas and were, and were trying to uh, uh, fashion the church uh, into their own vision as to what it should entail, which wasn't necessarily in keeping with Christ's teachings. But he says, that's just life. That's the way humans work. Couldn't tell where it was going, but he has no regrets for what he did. And then when I said to him, why didn't you, if you had these great powers to create miracles, why didn't you, uh, you know, stop yourself from being crucified? Why didn't you use your powers to escape? And he said because he felt that his death on the cross and in subsequent resurrection would make a very dramatic statement for his followers and so he let it all happen because he thought that was a great way to, uh, to, to make, a, a, make a point to, 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 to raise uh, 
his awareness amongst all the other people uh, and his followers. And so he allowed that to happen. So it was a very, very interesting conversation. He's a very wise and compassionate soul, as you can imagine. Um, and, uh, you, you, know, he's, uh, you know, we'd all be better off if we just followed his teachings per se, as opposed to uh, all the other dogmas and rules and beliefs that have been layered on by religious holy men since his death. Yeah. So, very interesting conversation. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and I'm so glad you went into that, um, Garnet, because I was going to ask you that about his thoughts about what has happened, you know, since his resurrection. Can I just ask you, did he mention um, the resurrection? I'm just really curious. Yeah, of course, he did. Yeah, he did. He, he did. There was a resurrection, of course, and he was uh, quite capable of doing that because of his powers. So he, he basically allowed himself to be crucified, and then he used his powers to, to rise up physically and, uh, you know, and meet with uh, his apostles and then just, you know, return back to the spirit side. So he was quite capable of doing that. And, and as I said, he did that to make a very bold and dramatic statement. Um, and, uh, you know, his, his main goal was to try to uh, uh, instill... Uh, love and compassion in, in, in all humanity, um, compassion for ourselves and for all the other humans and for everyone around us. That was his goal. That was his message. And he was a bit dismayed that somehow his message had been hijacked to some degree by the men who followed him who really had their own agendas and they were really seeking mm-hmm. power and control as opposed to, uh, as a primary thing, as opposed to helping humanity become more spiritually enlightened. So. He was a bit dismayed, but he, yeah. he, 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 he recognized that that's just how humans are, and, and they went off at a bit of a tangent, and, and so yeah. be it. And I, and I said to him, well, is there any chance you're going to come back once more uh, you know, as the new Messiah, uh, return again, and to, uh, because God knows we need a lot of help in that area. And he says, no plans now, but if the Council of Wise Ones wants him to, he's quite willing to come back. So it remains to be seen whether that will happen. That's very interesting, and in the book of Revelations, of course, that's predicted. So I'll be curious to see what he decides to do, you know, or what they decide to ask him to do. That's pretty amazing. Yes, and, and, I, and I, there's a lot of people on this planet who would love to have him come back to help us uh, find the, the path of spiritual enlightenment, but, uh, you know, it'll be when when they decide it's appropriate, I guess. And, and he, yeah. wouldn't, he, he wouldn't say any more. He wasn't going to tell me if or when it was going to happen. He just said depends on what the Council of Wise Ones wants. Mm-hmm. Okay, and not to belabor this point, but again, just being a Christian and raised Catholic and all that, I just you know this, this obviously just fascinates me. But um, you know, it's funny. I years ago I got into some of the teachings of Unity Church, and I love the fact that they stress his teachings, and one of them being everything I can do, you can do too, and even greater. And that wasn't something that was my experience. You know, going to church growing up, it was more about the guilt and sin, and, and you know, and you're a sinner and you've got to suffer and all that. That was more the message then all of these things that I can do, you can do too, and even greater. In other words, like letting people know that they have that same power within them, you know, that same um, source, I guess, if you will, or God. So Absolutely. And, and, and in fact, he, he said to me that, uh, you know, um, what I did on earth as a, as a master focusing my thoughts, he says, every human has the capacity to do that. We just have to start learning how to use more than 10% of our brain power and once we get it up there higher, we too can uh, uh, c- can create miracles. And, and he says there are humans, other than him, over the history who've been able to create miracles as well. Like not just, I mean, like Moses and some of the ones in the Bible. Mm-hmm. He says there's lots of other masters who have walked the earth, who haven't been as famous as, as he was, um, who have been working quietly, creating miracles, uh, basically unnoticed to help uh, humanity. So he says there's a number of other people who can do this. It's just that they're not nobody's as famous as him. Or Moses, and so he says, "Yes, but humanity, humans, start learning to use more of your brain power, and you too can do the same as I did." Yeah. Now you also, Garnet, met with his mother, Mary, and so what did she share with you? Well, she was a very uh, beautiful soul, wise, compassionate soul, and she sa- shared a number of things which I, I think I may have mentioned in my earlier books, but she basically reiterated them. She says that first of all. Uh, Jesus was not a virgin birth, that that she was not a virgin when Jesus was born, contrary to what the scriptures say, and he was not conceived by the miraculous intervention of the Holy Spirit or anyone else. She says that he was conceived through the sexual union of her and her husband Joseph. Uh, Very very contrasting with what the scriptures say. Yeah. And she and she says that uh you know, she says there's nothing there's nothing degrading about that in terms of Jesus. She said he's 
still is and still was a very great person, a great master, uh, regardless of how he was conceived. You know, but the, the, she said it was there was nothing miraculous about it. Um, and she and also she, she said that she had further children after Jesus. She had four sons and two daughters after Jesus. Mo- that's not mentioned in the scriptures except a few vague references where they talk about yeah. uh, the brothers of Jesus, uh, w- w- which a lot of the uh, theologians say doesn't mean it was Mary's children, but it could have been Joseph's from a previous marriage or cousins or whatever. They try to refute it to stick with yeah, the scripture that says do. Mary was a virgin all her life. She says, no, that's not the case. Um, and so she had other children, and she confirmed what Albert had told me before as well, uh, and I had actually seen a, a glimpse of this in the Akashic Records. She says that Jesus was married. He married Mary Magdalene, and they had t- two sons and a daughter uh, through that union. Uh, again, that's, there's no mention of that in the Scriptures because they uh, want to maintain, the people who edited the Scriptures want to maintain that Jesus was celibate, never married, had no children. Um, but he did have children with Mary Magdalene. And she says that after his crucifixion, she and Mary Magdalene smuggled uh, their children out of, the, out of Palestine to another country where they lived, uh, grew up, got married, had children of their own, and lived in relative obscurity. And she would not tell me you know, their names or locations or even their country. She said there's no uh, point in that. Um, and Albert wouldn't tell me either. So there are people on this planet who are direct dis- blood descendants of, of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, we, they, we just don't know who they are, at least I don't anyway. So very yeah. interesting... Very, yeah. very interesting uh, uh, discussion with her. Uh, <clears throat> she confirmed to me that, that she does has appeared on earth to people from time to time over the centuries to try to inspire uh, love, hope, and, and uh, uh, comfort to them, uh, to try to get them to encourage other humans to, you know, to be good to each other and to embrace love and compassion. So she has appeared you know, from time to time. You, know, you, you hear about these sightings like in uh, Fatima and Lourdes and so on, and yes, that was her. And, and, you know, her message was to try to help humanity uh, get back on the road to spiritual enlightenment. So very enlightened soul, very pleasant soul. Uh, I was delighted to meet her. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was, uh, when I was growing up as a Catholic, uh, she was one of uh, uh, my mother's favorite sort of saints or, uh, you know, deities. You know, and my mom always prayed to the to the Holy Virgin Mary, uh, and, and, and she regarded her as a sort of a very special uh, spirit who could intercede uh, um, on behalf of the people who prayed to her, intercede with uh, with Jesus, her son. And so uh, there's a very big history of that in my family, and I was delighted to meet with her. Wow, that's incredible. You know, it's very interesting to me, you know, talking about organized religion, that, you, you know, you have the Catholic devotion to Mary, and then you have, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to stereotype everyone, but I know a lot of evangelicals, not everyone, not every sect, but a, a lot of Protestants just generally do not seem to even want to acknowledge Mary at all. It's like we go from like these two extremes, um, and I don't, I don't really understand what the reason is. They feel like they accuse Catholics of elevating her, you know, with Jesus. And again, a lot of this is all the man-made stuff or the things that have that the writers of the scriptures decided to put in there. But it's created all this conflict, you know, <laughs> between different denominations. And this is, I mean, the, the prime example is the one with Mary because I've, I've had. You know, people, non-Catholics tell me, oh, you know, you, you guys worship her and she's not a god and all, all this kind of stuff. And, and that, this is all the human stuff that's going on, you know, da- down here on Earth. So I just find that very, very, very interesting, your encounter with her. Yeah, it was. And you're quite right. There is a, there is a huge gap between what the Catholics believe and what some of the other Protestants believe. Um, and that, that, that's just, I'm not sure how it arose. Uh, but, you know... It, when actually, when I got in speaking with Mary, of course, you realize that she's not a god in the sense that the that the, that the Catholics believe, nor is Jesus for that matter. I mean, uh, you know, God or the source is something over and above all those people, um, and so mm-hmm. it, 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 it's very different uh, in terms of the reality versus what the Catholics believe. But th- there's so many areas where the Catholics are just way offside, as I found in my adventures with Albert. That you know, I could almost write a whole book about it, but I won't. Uh, but I have mentioned some of them, and it's uh, you know, it, it, it's really very enlightening to find out the real truth about Mary and Jesus and and some of the other people, mm-hmm. as opposed to in contrast with what the Catholics have been preaching for for centuries. Yeah, you know, and just one other thing before we, because I know we have to move on. But another thing, I always found it so interesting that people, 
get, got all upset about the thought that Jesus could have brothers or maybe Mary wasn't a, wasn't a virgin. And I was, even when I was still going to church, I was like, well, who cares? Like, what, why does that even matter? Like, who cares? If, you know, I, I, you know, it's just so funny how people get very locked into the dogma. And I, I just never really understood why that was such a big, a big deal to people. You know, the thought no, that... No, no. He, yeah, yeah, sorry, nor did I, because I always thought that the emphasis on, for example, Mary being a virgin, it's like, yeah, what's the big deal? I mean, what, you know, it, it was basically, you know, as uh, as Mary said to me, the, the fact that they sort of emphasized my virginity, perpetual virginity, uh, <laughs> was was sort of like a backhanded slap to all the good women in the world who give birth to children in the natural way and had intercourse with their husbands. It's almost like saying they're, they can never be quite as holy as me because they had sexual intercourse, which is just wrong because sexual yeah. intercourse is a very natural part of humanity. You know. Right, right, exactly, yeah. That's very very interesting. Well, wow, what a, what a cool interaction you, you had. Um, thank you for sharing that. So now on, on one of your trips to the spirit side, you actually got to meet one of your guardian angels. So what did you learn from her? Oh, that was a very, very interesting encounter because as I was growing up, of course, I, you know, people always told me that everyone has a guardian angel. I didn't know if that was uh, for real or if it was just a myth created by, you know, religious holy men about guardian angels. And so Albert took me one day on the spirit side to meet one of my guardian angels, and her name was Anna Peel. She was a beautiful lady, just exquisitely beautiful, uh, you know, breathtakingly beautiful. And she was a very wise, compassionate soul. And she told me that her job as my guardian angel was to make sure that I didn't uh, uh, have an untimely death during my time on earth. And what she said by untimely meant is that a, a death by some accident when my soul was not ready to leave my incarnation. And this confirmed what Albert had told me is that no one dies by accident. We die when our souls are ready to leave the incarnation. And our souls have the absolute right to choose when and where this will happen. But she says that because of the clash of free wills, among all humans on our planet, sometimes some event could happen that might result in our untimely deaths before our souls are ready to leave. And she says that's where guardian angels step in. And what they do is they will intervene to make sure that we will avoid some event or incident that might cause our physical deaths. And so they can do this in a number of ways. They can Initially, they will send us a strong, intuitive message to change our plans or to take a different course of action. Um, and, and so she said, for example... If you're, if you're booked to fly on a plane where she can foresee that the plane is going to crash, she'll send you a strong, intuitive message to say, you better change your plans, take a different flight, fly on a different day. And if that doesn't work, they can actually physically intervene by, say, causing your tire to go flat on the way to the airport so you miss that flight. So that's just one example. They can, they can actually physically intervene. They can actually physically appear in your life as a human or another entity to help you uh, on your way, to help you, uh, you know, if you're lost, to find, help you find your way back home to avoid an accident and, uh, uh, you know, things like that. And so that is her role, to make sure that, that, uh, that, that, that we preserve our physical bodies until our souls are ready to leave. Um, and so and I said to her, well, you know, people die in car accidents every day. What happened there was, was their, their guardian angel asleep at the switch? And she says, no, if somebody dies in a car accident, it's because the soul of that person decided that was the place to exit the incarnation. And so, it, 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 so they, they, they don't prevent all accidents. They only prevent the ones uh, where, where our souls are not ready to leave. And so it was funny. I said to her, well, you mustn't have been very busy in my case because I didn't recall any near misses. And she scoffed at my selected memory and said... <laughs> You know, I, she said, I've had to save your butt so many times I've lost count. And then she, and, and then she said to me, uh, here's a few examples. And she gave me a few examples in my past life uh, where I, I, I nearly missed death. And when she told me about it, I recalled the incidents. But at the time, I thought I had just been lucky to escape calamity. And she says, that was no luck. That was me intervening to save you because it wasn't your time to go. So it was a very interesting conversation, and it, it really it left me feeling with a, a great sense of comfort, comfort because I felt, you know, it's really nice to know that this wise, compassionate uh, spirit is there watching over me 24-7 to make sure that I don't suffer an untimely death, uh, which doesn't mean that I won't die someday. I will, of course, but it will be when my soul chooses to die, 
uh, to leave the incarnation. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, my soul doesn't tell me what, it, you know, what, it, what its plans are, which is probably a good thing because I don't think I, as a human, would want to know exactly when I'm going to depart. Now, I agree with you. I wouldn't either. And, you know, I've, I've, I've learned that about guardian angels as far as, you know, the exit points and, and, and when your soul is ready to die. So it's great to hear you offer that confirmation, you know, based on this experience you had, you've had. Um, well, fascinating yeah. stuff. It really is. Now, oh, gosh. Yeah, it, yeah it, was, it, it was too bad everyone couldn't meet the guardian angels I did, but it should suffice for people to know, take comfort in the fact that everyone has one or more guardian angels and that they are very much like my guardian angel and that they are there to help you and probably have helped you in the past, even though you you may not have realized it. Oh, yeah, no, I can think of one incident where I absolutely know I was 15 years old and my life flashed before me. I thought my brother and I, there, there was an 18-wheeler truck coming right at us. And I remember closing my eyes to brace for it because I just thought, okay, well, I guess I'm going to die. Okay, like it was weird in that split second I had that sort of resignation about the whole thing. And then I opened my eyes, and we were fine, and the truck was gone. It wasn't, and, I, and so I know for, I could say that that was. I'm sure that was my guardian angel, and probably my brother's too, <laughs> uh, at that point. But that was a yeah, wild. Yeah, absolutely. Experience. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Okay, so now this this is going to get really interesting. If people listening to this think, you know, consider some of this stuff sacrilege, I'm sure they're going to love this this next topic about Lucifer. Now. Albert took you to meet Lucifer on another excursion, and I need to ask you, like, how is that even possible when he's told you all along that Lucifer doesn't even exist? Uh, yeah, well, that, that was quite amazing when, when uh, Albert said, I'm going to take you to visit Lucifer, and I says, well, how is that? Because you already told me that Satan, the devil, does not exist. And he says, oh, no, no, but this is different. So he took me to meet Lucifer, who is a very uh, wise, compassionate, uh, you know, beneficent soul, uh, who, who, who told me that he had been badly maligned over the years by humans who had uh, given them the, the, uh, the name of the you know, Prince of Darkness and the personification of all evil. They had basically equated him with Satan. He says, first of all, Satan doesn't exist, so that's not possible. But he says that he's not uh, one of God's fallen angels. He's really one of God's uh, uh, you know, uh, angels that, that does good works uh, on earth to help uh, humans get over the rough patch that we're in. And he says that contrary to uh, being the personification of evil, he, he actually spends most of his time trying to curtail uh, evil and violence on our planet. So very much 180 degrees from how people have characterized him. So he's, he, he's, he's a very uh, beneficial soul uh, who, who, who he says has worked over the centuries by sending strong intuitive messages and messages and dreams and, and in other ways to try to stop some of the violence that, that, that occurs in our planet. And he says it doesn't always work but because there's still a lot of violence, but he says that he has been very successful in some instances, some very famous uh, events uh, where he's been able to prevent a lot of uh, uh, evil and, and damage and violence. And he gave me three examples. He said that he um, was instrumental, according to him anyway, instrumental in encouraging President Lincoln to abolish slavery. And then he says um, that during World War II, he, uh, he uh, sent strong messages to the Nazi scientists who were developing the A-bomb for Hitler, sent them strong messages that they needed to drag their feet so that the bomb wouldn't be available to Hitler during the Second World War. So that was a very good news because it, it, it could have been uh, a lot of awful damage if Hitler had the A-bomb before America had it and before the war ended. And oh, then the third sure. example... And the third example he says was that during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember that or not, Daria, but um, it, during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were going head to head, and, 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 and everyone feared that World War III would be started. And he said that he sent strong messages to the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev uh, to, to stop him. He was stop him from basically pushing the button on the missiles to start World War III. And he said, we came very close to the brink of World War III during that time, and he, uh, he basically uh, sent strong intuitive messages to the Soviet leader to stop him from taking that action. So anyway, that's what he claimed. I, and I said, well, yeah, good for you. Those are all good deeds. Uh, and he says, those are just three <laughs> examples, and uh, I continually try to influence people to, to try to curtail evil on your planet. So very interesting very much of a, a, a polar opposite from how people had characterized Lucifer as a fallen angel and, uh, you know, and, and uh, the, the, 
sort of the, uh, somebody who's equated with the devil over the centuries. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so we, we know that evil exists, but maybe it's been sort of personified, I guess, through this, you know, figure, you know, that people think of as Satan, you know, it seems like anyway, because we know bad people do bad things, but it's more people doing bad things. Is that, is that what he was saying, that it's not yeah, really... Yeah, he, he, he said there's know. no devil, there's no evil spirit, there's, there's nobody sort of on the spirit side who is sitting there and encouraging uh, humans to do evil. He says humans uh, are quite capable of doing a lot of evil on their own, and that's how it arises on our planet. It's not the devil or Lucifer or anybody else who's, uh, who's egging them on. Uh, it's really humans losing control of their negative emotions. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, and that makes sense to me. Okay, so... Um, you had a frightening encounter with a black hole. So tell us what that was all about. Well, that was, I, I wasn't sure why Albert took me there, but on one of the trips he just says, come on, I'm going to show you uh, uh, something that you find very interesting in the center of our galaxy. And it was a black hole. And, you know, the, uh, astronomers tell us that black holes are caused uh, usually when a star collapses on itself and the resulting uh, core mass is so dense uh, and its gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light, so they call it a black hole. Anyway, he took me down into this black hole, and, and I've never felt uh, this way before because I, I was uh, in complete sensory deprivation. Everything was black. I couldn't see, feel, or hear anything. I had no sense of passing time. It, I was like in a, in a hell hole, um, and, and I, I felt like, you know, I, I felt the panic welling up in my chest because I thought that maybe there's no escape and that maybe Albert had been fooling me he had told me there's no hell, but maybe he brought me here to hell. And it was an awful feeling. And Albert wasn't around. I couldn't see him anywhere. So I was totally uh, in this deep, dark blackness. Um, it, was very, it was very frightening. Until then, um, much to my relief, I saw a pinprick of light way off in the distance. And as mm. the light sort of came closer to me, the, the light expanded. And soon it, it engulfed my whole body. And I was out of the black hole. And I found myself in a basically a subatomic world. I found myself staring at what looked like to be an atom with a nucleus and an electrons orbiting around it. And then some invisible force started pushing me away, zooming me out. And I noticed that there were other atoms, similar atoms, that had clumped together to form a molecule. And then as I zoomed further out, I saw that these all molecules had all joined together to form a shiny black substance that sparkled in the sunlight. And then as I zoomed out even further, I found myself emerging from the black eye of a teddy bear sitting on a shelf in my family room. Oh, so my I'd somehow God. Gotten, and I'd somehow gotten back out of the black hole back to my family room. And there was Albert standing beside me. He was chuckling because he knew I was frightened. And I said, Albert, you know, why did you leave me? I, you know, you scared the heck out of me. And he said, oh, I was there all along with you. I just chose not to show myself. And you were only there for about 30 seconds of Earth time. So it was no big deal. And he said, I wanted to show you that sometimes you cannot really appreciate the light until you truly experience the darkness. And he was very, very right about that because after that I experienced, I looked at everything on my planet, everything around me in a much different light and I much more appreciated the lightness and I hoped that it would never go back to the darkness of that black hole. So it was a, quite a frightening experience. Wow. Yeah, and that is very profound and, and <coughs> truth right there. Um, so, Garnet, tell us, what's the genesis of your book title, Dance of Heavenly Bliss? Well, this was, this was one of the fun trips I had. After the black hole experience, I said to Albert, <laughs> okay, you, 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 you've you given me a distressing Show trip here, a frightening trip. Yeah, you, you, know, you owe me a fun trip, okay? So he <laughs> says, okay. So he took me to the spirit side, and there he introduced me to a soul by the name of Votan. And Votan uh, briefly told me that he and I had a, a, a previous life together in Tikal, in one of the, the Mayan uh, cities, and that he had been a court scribe, I had been a, a lady in waiting for the daughter of the monarch, and that we had fallen in love and got married and had children. So he says that was the last life we had together. And then he said, let me show you something. So he stood up, and he just literally walked into me. And I felt like uh, he and I had somehow fused our spirits into one clump of energy, and my whole body tingled with a surge of divine love that left me aching with ineffable pleasure as wave after wave of orgasmic euphoria rippled through my body in a rhapsody of sheer delight. Um, it, was a, it was an amazing experience. It was, a, it was like the exhilaration from the divine, from the merger of our divine energies. Then he stepped back and he chuggled. He looked at me and he says, 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that because you have just experienced the dance of heavenly bliss. And he said that that's a dance that's done frequently and openly among all souls on the spirit side as a way of expressing their love for each other and for the source. And he says, when you cross over permanently to the spirit side when your physical body dies, uh, you can look forward to enjoying this. And I said, well, you got that right, Botan. I can hardly wait to do that again. So that's where the book <laughs> title came from. Oh, that is great. Awesome. Wow. So, Garnet, where can our listeners purchase a copy of Dance of Heavenly Bliss? Well, it's available in all the popular online stores, uh, and there's buy links on my website, which is com. So you can just click on Amazon uh, or Barnes & Noble and a number of the other places. It takes you right to where you can buy my books. Um, it's available in a number of bricks-and-mortar stores, and if your favorite store does not have it, they can order it for you. So I suggest that the easiest way is to go to my website and hit the buy links. You can also find out uh, information about my books. Uh, there's book videos for each of them. You can download free excerpts, um, and you can dial into my social media sites for updates, which like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and so on. And um, mm-hmm. on my website, I have recordings of all of my radio shows, so you can dial in and listen to any of them I've done in the past. And this Darianne is number 92 for me for radio shows uh, since the last uh, three years. Oh, and good. this one will be posted as well, yeah. Excellent. Oh, I'm so excited. Yes, I, you know, just as a reminder, I'm glad you said that. I got a nice prompt that, that, you know, this show will be archived. And I just want to thank my archive listeners in advance um, for listening. And, yes, isn't technology wonderful? I mean, it really it has opened up so many opportunities for us as authors to be able to, you know, share our message with people we wouldn't be able to reach, really, otherwise. So it really is a blessing. Yeah, it absolutely is, and it, it really helps uh, us get the message out there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's everyone's job, my job, your job, and all the other channels in the world to try to get the message of, of love, hope, and inspiration out to people so we can really change our ways. That's what it's really all about, embracing love and compassion. Yeah, amen. Well, Garnett, I want to thank you so much for joining me again. I, I just love having you on the show, so please keep me updated if you have plans for another book. Um, and when that is published, or you, know, you are, you know, you know, you're welcome back anytime. I just love talking to you, and I know my audience does as well. And just wish you much continued success. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me on your show. Uh, it's delightful as it was the first time. And yes, there will be another book. Book four is about three quarters of the way done, and I'd love to be on your show again when that's released. Excellent. Yes. Well, we're following each other on Twitter and all social media, so I will, uh, you know, just let me know, and we will make that happen for sure. And, and, thank there, you for, and thank you for just being such a positive light in the world and for really getting these messages out there. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm d- d- you know, delighted to be on your show to, to speak to your listeners, and hopefully uh, together we can uh, start to change the world. Amen. Amen to that. All right, Garnett, will you enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll be, talk- we'll be in touch soon. Take you too, care. Darianne. Bye-bye. Okay, God bless. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, that is going to wrap up this week's edition of Right Stream Tuesday. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. Um, in a couple of minutes after signing off, Blog Talk Radio will archive this episode, which is fabulous. Um, please, again, let me, let me just, I'm going to go ahead and spell his website because I have the correct spelling of his name right here just so that you all get it, and I encourage you to go visit. It's Garnett Schulhauser. It's G, like George, A-R-N-E-T, S. C H U L H A U S E R dot com. All right, everybody. Um, next week we're going to be talking about flash fiction. I'm so excited. So I have two guests who have a flash fiction podcast, and they're going to tell us all about, first of all, what flash fiction is and how it can really help us all become better writers. So I will be back here again next week at 1 p.m. Eastern. And you know what? Coming up on Thursday night, let me put a plug in for Love, Liberty, and Lip Gloss. Um, as many of you know, Donna Lyons took over hosting that show back in March, and she's doing an outstanding job. Um, but this Thursday, she asked me if I could fill in for her, and her guest just happens to be William Todd, who is a really a successful entrepreneur and a protege of Bob Proctor. Um, for those of you who've studied the Law of Attraction or seen The Secret or um, know of Bob's books, um, you know why I'm so excited. I, I cannot wait to talk to him Thursday night. We will go live at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll be talking about the law of attraction and finding out how he has used it in his own life to achieve tremendous success. So I hope you'll tune in for that. And uh, the rest of the week, uh, Speculative Fiction Cantina will be live on Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. 
followed by Saturday morning, Get Fit, Feel Fabulous with Brit at 10 a.m. Eastern. And then we'll be back around to Sunday, and Lisa Tarvis will be on the air with another episode of Just Believe and Psychic Readings. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Um, have a fabulous day. Stay in that flow of creativity. Visit us at rightstreampublishing.com and rightstreamradio.com to find out all about us. Oh, and we have, you know, check out our YouTube channel, Rightstream Media. I recently added a new promo video for our company. Uh, we've got Lieutenant Spike, Keith Schneider, whose, whose book is coming out. Um, it is available for pre-order now uh, on Amazon.com to guard my every neighbor inside the fire. We just posted a video with him on there. We've got book trailers for The Seventh Symbol, A Modern Allegory, Miami Breast Cancer Experts, Just Believe. So visit uh, Rightstream Media. Um, we just posted uh, another video, too, a book trailer for Ego in a Teabag, How Greed, Corruption, and Deceit Threaten a Great American Movement, and that's by Ken Crow. So um, please go to Rightstream Media at YouTube uh, to watch all of our videos. And you can see us, uh, what, what, where else? We're on Facebook, <laughs> Rightstream Radio Network, and Rightstream Publishing, LLC, at Rightstream on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Daria Ann, D-A-R-I-A-A-N-N-E. <laughs> I have to stop and think for a second. And I'm also, I have a Daria Ann author public page on Facebook. And we also have a Love, Liberty, and Lip Gloss Facebook page. And you know what? If you go to RightstreamRadio.com and RightstreamPublishing.com, it's all there. So, again, thank you, everyone, for joining me today. I will see you back here next week when we'll be talking about flash fiction. Stay in the flow of creativity and have a wonderful day.